Welcome, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the official podcast of the Wisdom Factory Literary Society. Here we are committed to the practical application of knowledge so that we may develop ourselves to our true potential. Along with individual improvement, we seek to unite knowledge with action for the betterment of mankind. In order to accomplish our task, we facilitate dialogue and debate through literature and media, but most importantly, through lively conversations amongst individuals like you who are brilliant, experienced, and who maintain the ability to exercise sound judgment. This episode features Professor Popescu, an expert in many areas of foreign policy. He will be joined by Preston and Nicholas, and together they will be analyzing the actions of state sponsors of terrorism and assessing the threat they pose to American security. They will also be offering policy options about how the U.S. should conduct its foreign policy when it comes to interacting with countries that support terrorists. Enjoy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Wisdom Factory podcast. My name is Preston Nieves. I'm with... Nicholas Maduro, not really. It's Nicholas Flores. <laughs> Nicholas Flores. And we have a very special guest today, um, Dr. Popescu. Dr. Popescu, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, this is Jonas Popescu. I'm a professor of political science at Texas State. All right. And uh, today we're going to be discussing a topic that is very serious um, and has some major implications for United States national security, and that is state sponsors of terrorism. Uh, now, recently, I had the privilege of attending a conference at Texas A&M called SCONA, where we talked about counterterrorism and some of the ways that the United States can respond to the threat that terrorism poses, and that we broke out into roundtable sessions, and mine was focused on state sponsors of terrorism, uh, specifically we zeroed in on countries like North Korea, uh, Syria, Iran, and Sudan, who have been proven to provide financing and material support for terrorist organizations. Um, and the objective of this podcast really is going to be to just go over the threat that they pose and how can we, we can address it. Um, so really the way this is going to work, um, I'm going to you know present the topic and we'll give Dr. Popescu a chance to respond. And then Nicholas can have any comments and I'll wrap it up before moving to the next question. Um, so the first thing, you know, we recognize that you know our audience is pretty broad and that not everybody who listens since this podcast has maybe a super in-depth knowledge. So the first question is, um, what what is a state sponsor of terrorism? And then more specifically, how has the threat posed uh, by state sponsors of terrorism evolved uh, since 9-11, which, as we know, was the event that really got terrorism to become a front and center security concern uh, for the United States? Thanks, Preston, and uh, it's great to be with you guys and with your audience. And uh, the first thing to start with when we talk about state sponsors of terrorism, I think it's useful to step, take one step back and think of terrorism as a tactic of war that can be used both by states, but also by non-state actors. So historically, there were states such as Libya during Muammar Gaddafi, who would engage in actual terrorist attacks, such as downing an airplane or the same can be said for uh, Iran, who is using terrorist attacks in conjunction with other types of uh, military aggression. And so states can use terrorism as a means to inflict pain and suffering on an adversary, just as they would use normal military force. Now. There are also other states, and in the context of the United States and 9-11, really what hurt us the most, obviously Al-Qaeda, was not a state, it was a non-state actor, but crucially that non-state actor benefited from the state support of Afghanistan because obviously Al-Qaeda would have never been able to plan and execute the 9-11 terrorist attack had they not had this base of support in Afghanistan. So that form of support of hosting a terrorist group was basically what the United States set out to root 
out basically eliminate and that was the bush doctrine after 9-11 that we will not no longer make a distinction between terrorists and the states that help them and in that particular context what that meant was not that we're going to go to war against every state that ever held a terrorist group but specifically for groups that are enemies of the united states and that could hurt the u.s homeland such as al-qaeda or now we see that in the case of isis we will no longer make a distinction between the states that host these groups and the groups themselves so that's why we went to war in afghanistan and we're still there after all this time because we're not quite confident yet that if we were to leave the local government of afghanistan would not provide support for uh, al-qaeda or isis once more and incidentally that's also why we're in syria and iraq to make sure that isis does not gain the support of a state or the resources of a state so i think that that first distinction is very important to keep in mind between states using terrorism and then states hosting terrorist groups or providing support to terrorist groups and this while the first one is a problem normally we kind of know how to deal with that much better because you can you know uh, use all sorts of ways to get at a state that's trying to use terrorism against you. The second one is a little more difficult, and that's something that we've, we've been struggling along with, struggling a lot with, in terms of making sure that these international terrorist groups do not either gain the access to something like a nuclear weapon from a state or just gain access to the resources of a state such as being allowed to to train and uh, to travel to benefit from perhaps passports and er anything else that would allow them to function mm -hmm. yeah for sure and that is is definitely a uh, a complex threat and this is where um nick uh, I, w I want you to kind of follow up um a little bit um because you know dr popescu did a great job of, of breaking down you know the nature of the challenge um so nicholas how do you think this impacts the calculus that the united states has to make um in terms of responding to terrorists because like what i'm really seeing you know when it comes to these state sponsors of terrorism is that it's a hybrid threat that's what makes it so challenging that we're used to dealing with either these irregular terrorist actors or the right. country uh, but when you have state sponsors of terrorism you're having to deal with an enemy that has aspects of both so uh, you know what what how does that shift the dynamic Nick how that shifts the dynamic well I would have to start off with this small bit first and it's that for the most part when it comes to terrorist organizations uh, like I just said for the most part they tend to be very uh, they're non-state actors unless they're funded by outside sources state actors and their structure is typically very decentralized so in that sense they can get funding from local and outside sources while also in the case that uh, I'll use an example of the old Greek mythology of the Hydra if you were to cut off one head two would pop up somewhere else and it's not only with terrorist organizations it's also the same thing with what you see in the drug wars and mm -hmm. so forth so um, so yeah, that's what I would say in this regard. I don't know if I answered your deal. Yeah, no, that, that, that was pretty good, you know, and I think, you know, with that, um, you know, we could probably move on to the next question. So I think it's been established, you know, what the nature of this threat is. Um, so the next thing we want to discuss is, you know, what, how should we deal with these organizations specifically is it better or not the organizations the, the the states that sponsor them is it better to deal with them through more of a forceful sort of brinkmanship kind of approach um or is diplomacy and negotiation preferred because as we remember from the bush administration you know the bush administration talked about how we don't negotiate with terrorists and i think there was good reasons for that you know that these these are groups that were you know lack respect for the most basic human rights but at the same time america's military intervention uh, our willingness to overthrow governments um, 
in some cases seems to have exacerbated the problem, notably when it comes to nuclear terrorism, like, for example, how, you know, Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program, then he got invaded. That caused Iran and North Korea to feel more entrenched in their belief uh, that they need nuclear weapons to protect themselves against the United States. So, uh, Dr. Popescu, which approach do you think is better? Or if there's not one that's inherently better, how do we determine which of the two um, needs to be used? What factors influence our decision when discussing, you know, whether or not we should try to negotiate with them and give these actors some legitimacy in exchange for stopping their state sponsorship of terrorism versus, you know, having to actually stand up to them up to and possibly even including completely overthrowing the regime and replacing it with a new government? That's a great question. And I think that hits at the particular case of how we handled after 9-11 al-Qaeda and the uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan because we tried most of those things basically at different times and I think there are some lessons to be to be taken from that experience so if you guys remember after 9-11 when uh, President Bush announced the doctrine of we're not going to allow states to host these terrorists any longer he called on the Taliban regime to turn over Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda network and uh, the Taliban, whether because they were unable to do so militarily or because they doubted President Bush's uh, willingness to actually go to war and uh, overthrow their regime, or for other reasons of their own, decided against turning over bin Laden and al-Qaeda, in which case we, of course, went ahead and uh, removed them from power and installed a new government and so in that case we tried diplomacy didn't work then we went with military force and we sure enough eliminated al-qaeda sanctuary at least for for a period of time and uh, then what happened kind of fast forward 18 years till today we're in a position where maybe most of your audience have seen the recent news that we are now negotiating with the Taliban an arrangement by which they can return to form a unity government with the local Afghan government in exchange for the promise that they will not allow Al-Qaeda or ISIS on their territory. So we're almost coming back full circle to negotiations with with the Taliban in in the case of Afghanistan. So in, in that case, obviously, the the lesson I think that we've been learning at a very painful cost was that while removing a, the government was probably necessary and still the right call, I, I doubt that there was a better way of uh, dealing with Al-Qaeda at the time than removing the Taliban. Replacing them turned out to have been very, very difficult. and. Uh, you know, you could argue that we could have arrived at this particular deal that we arrived now 10, 15 years ago, instead of going the whole 18 years, just to, to come to this conclusion that uh, we just are unable to install a sustainable non-Taliban regime in, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, if you think of uh, other particular countries that, that may pose a threat, I think that you know, you, you have basically what you want to do when you're trying to, to be strategically effective is match the threat to the level of resources that you're willing to put in. So if we're talking about the highest threat, highest end, say, do not pass nuclear weapons to terrorists, in that case, you want to be as clear as possible that if you even think about doing that, we're going to blow you up so fast, you won't even have time to you know, actually, actually do that. On the other hand, if it's more of a question of, uh, you know, as unfortunately turns out to be the case with uh, countries that we otherwise have uh, good relations like Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, that, you know, there are people in your country who support these groups, whether inside of government or outside, whether by uh, financial support or other type. There's been, you know, a lot of talk about uh, the Pakistani intelligence service. Lots of people accuse them of supporting jihadi groups. And the same goes for certain Saudi charities. So should, 
th that kind of support is much more amenable to diplomatic pressure and I don't have to threaten to invade them for that. And uh, lastly, the third bucket is countries that we don't like that are enemies of the United States that do support terrorism. And uh, here you have your, your Iran, the North Koreas. And for those, you can address kind of a mixed approach in which you you are and you know this country support terrorism both against us and our allies so obviously a lot of this conversation has to do with uh, what our allies are doing about it and they're doing things you know israel in the case of iran japan in the case of north korea they're doing things on their own as well so it don't it, it doesn't mean we're always going to to be there and and now of course you also have uh, this uh, this mess in uh, in latin america with iranian fingerprints in, in many ways. So for those kind of things, you you have a more diplomatic financial sanctions type approach and financial sanctions in particular, when you tailor them to the actual individuals involved in this uh, in these acts can be quite, uh, quite potent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and just actually a quick follow up question because you mentioned North Korea, and that's actually what my um, roundtable discussion decided to focus on. And we came up with a plan uh, to negotiate North with North Korea, and that the idea was to try to give them legitimacy in exchange for them giving up uh, their state sponsorship of terrorism. And that you know, so we came up with all sorts of details of like allowing them to establish an embassy um, in exchange for nuclear disarmament, and like that the embassy that you know that could be coupled with like, lifting of sanctions. And that kind of stuff um but obviously this was a recommendation and that what trump is doing you know is is what trump is doing he sort of has you know, his own agenda and he's been praised by how he's handled the north korea crisis by some but there's others who are wary of their long-term objectives considering especially the fact that they're backed by china and that kim jong-un is very unpredictable uh, so my follow-up question is what what do you think of trump's handling of north korea do you think that he's on the right path do you think that this form of diplomacy that he's engaging in um, is, is what we should be doing? Um, or is there something else that you think would be more effective? Is there a potential problem that you see within this that, that could cause us to create well, you know, what they would call a security paradox, where our efforts actually end up making us less secure in the long term? I think right now, as we're recording this, President Trump and uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un are in uh, just getting ready to meet tomorrow in Hanoi in Vietnam for their for their big second meeting and uh, I don't see anything wrong with uh, meeting and talking about these uh, issues diplomatically given the very very limited military response that we could have in the case of North Korea so this is the I think uh, among the the stronger things we could do basically economic sanctions and diplomatic pressure and uh, the issue of uh, you know th there are a number of different issues w we would be bothered by their nuclear weapons even if they were to force war assisting uh, terrorists in any way because them having a nuclear weapon is a threat to south korea and to japan and uh, it's just not a good strategic thing for us regardless of uh, of the question of the sponsor of mm -hmm. terrorism but that's definitely one of the ones which i think the state sponsor of terrorism part that sh should they commit not to do that could be a uh, important concession that they would make which would allow for uh, definitely for some relief on economic sanctions and uh, you'll still leave the issue of uh, do they remain a, a nuclear power or not which i think that they would remain because it's virtually unheard of for a country that became an established nuclear power to be talked out of giving up their nuclear weapons they may chose to do that for reasons of their own should they have a changing government or uh, uh, another uh, should their regime collapse but as far as just buying driving them out of it or talking them out of it has never been done and I don't think it's going to be done in this case either so it could be that the most that we could hope for are things such as you suggested them committing not to not to sell any kind of weapon design or material to terrorist groups and uh, to take steps to at least 
at least secure their weapons very well and uh, make sure that they do not pose proliferation threats to uh, other countries such as Iran that might be tempted to continue as they have in the past to try to purchase uh, nuclear weapon related materials from North Korea. Yeah, I def I agree with it. Like, I definitely see that you know if we were to get nu- North Korea to disarm, that's more of a long term goal. You know, I don't think that's going to be something that happens um, immediately. Um, before getting on to our, our last segment, Nick, uh, do you have any remarks on this? I do. Well, actually, it's more like a question rather than a remark. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Professor Popescu, um earlier you mentioned about Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan as being. Uh, even though Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are tech, are considered allies of the U.S., there's still signs, if not uh, truths, that they have been supporting some form of terrorism throughout the Middle East. And also, from what I understand, it seems like Saudi Arabia and Iran seem to be in a sort of cold war, and it seems to be the most prevalent in places such as uh, Syria with and uh, Yemen. And also, as part of a I guess you could call it a sub question in response to this it seems like Saudi Arabia has taken an interest with Israel to try to as an enemy of my enemy is my friend so what's your take on it and if so what do you think would be the possible path for both these countries and for how the US should respond in this regard I think that particular development of Saudi Israeli cooperation is one to be welcomed because obviously the stronger the coalition against Iran, the easier it will be for us to to continue to apply pressure and to achieve our goals in in that circumstance. And uh, you know, oftentimes, world politics, not to to be very cliche, is. Uh, consisting of you know bad and worse options and not every ally that you have is your ideal ally in fact even the ones that we think as our best ally still you know like look at the europeans we still have lots of lots of problems with them so it's not uh, not necessarily the case that we can uh, be terribly picky but that all uh, as far as uh, who our allies are in certain in certain areas of the world and addressing specific issues but of course, that doesn't mean that we are not continuously aware and uh, vigilant about making sure that they are not, uh, you know, saying something to us and then go around and say something totally different to to our enemies. And uh, and a lot of these times when you talk about these countries, you know, there are people in their government and outside that are very committed to doing the right things and there are people who are not. So it's often an internal fight in their governments and their military and intelligence establishments. And uh, so there, there's only so much we can, we can do about that as far as uh, shifting those, those particular behaviors. But we certainly were successful in, uh, in cases where we had specific and after 9-11 in particular cracked down really hard on Pakistan support for for radical Islamist groups and uh, they, uh, they they definitely took took many steps to, to address that after 9-11 as we were in Afghanistan but in general yeah, it's just going to be a, a long-term challenge this uh, this issue of uh, the priorities of our allies, which are not always identical with our priorities. Yeah, and I I definitely think that, you know, one major goal, to the greatest extent possible, because obviously the Middle East is very complicated and we don't want to give our enemies too much wiggle room. Um, You know, we've seen some of the dangers of that with, you know, the rise of China, for instance. Um, But at the same time, I think engagement is still important. And one thing that I, you know, really think would be good, you know, is the United States try to, you know, try to engage with Iran and Saudi Arabia to prevent escalation. Because I don't think, I agree with you that I don't think that we can just sort of, you know, intervene in some way that's going to erase this problem. Uh, But what it is, is that especially with the Iranian nuclear program, that, you know, the potential for this conflict to go nuclear or to escalate to some sort of out of control war or, or, you know, even economic conflicts, like, you know, the, the potential is there. And, you know, the more ambitious, you know, each side is, the more likely it, it, you know, ends up being the case. 
case. And I feel like the United States, you know, with Iran, sometimes we send some very mixed messages, like flip-flopping on the Iran deal, for example. Um, and then, you know, even with Israel and Saudi Arabia, sometimes we do have some double standards, particularly when it comes to human rights. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, it's important to address those in a way that doesn't lead us on that slippery slope to appeasement. Because I think sometimes the people who want to address, say, like Israeli human rights abuses or um, or Saudi Arabia support for terrorism, that they want to take that to like some this extreme idea that like we should just appease Iran or something, you know, and that's definitely something to be avoided. But really, um, so the last thing, because um, we're, we're getting ready to run out of time. Um, so the last thing I want to ask, and I know you talk, you know, we talked about this a lot, particularly with North Korea, um, about the strategy of negotiation. And, and personally, considering how Kim is and considering the fact that they're backed by China, I do have certain reservations about that. However, the reason why I support it in principle is because of the fact that it's important that we manage our resources effectively. That the United States military has become very overstretched in large part due to the war on terror. Um, and one of the biggest objectives that I really see us having is not only keeping ourselves safe from terrorism and safe from uh, you know the, the countries who back it, but also making sure that we don't hand them a long-term victory through this war of attrition by destroying our economy in order to counter them. Uh, so the last question is, how do you think we should prioritize threats um, and, and how do you think we should manage our fiscal policy on our resources in responding to um, terrorist organizations? Uh, like, and, and, and specifically, that's kind of a broad question. So specifically in the context of our objectives, like I, for example, am of the position that our objectives has a, have a tendency to become too broad um, and that's why we get bogged down. Uh, so how do you think the United States should reform its mindset and redefine our objectives in order to be able to effectively combat the organizations and countries that threaten us without continuing to spend trillions of dollars that we don't have on wars that, you know, are, are generating questionable strategic results in the long term. Yeah, and I think on uh, this issue, there are definitely certain things that cost a lot more than others. And here, the big difference I see it is between long term military campaigns, uh, counterinsurgency style campaigns like was the case with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, as opposed to much narrower, shorter counterterrorism campaigns as we are doing all around the world with using drone strikes, special forces. So the second po style of uh, military operations are far more effective and affordable than the long-term military campaigns alone are less costly in, uh, in human terms and in the opportunity cost as you are saying as diverting a lot of resources that may be better spent towards addressing the rise of china or russia's resurgence so i definitely think that reprioritizing the war on terror towards narrower counterterrorism. some people call that a raiding strategy basically you go in you uh, just blow up the terrorists, you leave. If they pop up again, you go in again, blow them up again, you leave. As opposed to trying and staying to address the so-called deeper roots of the conflict and trying to re-engineer the societies to um, make them kind of, you know, uh, democratic capitalist societies or whatnot. So I think one of the lessons, the painful lessons of the last almost two decades after 9-11 was this uh, limitation in uh, how much how broad your objectives ought to be as far as any particular uh, operation when it comes to this question of uh, of nation building and uh, i think that that that's something that both the u.s military but even more so the american public and u.s leaders kind of came to to agree that you know you you don't want to keep getting bogged down in wars like iraq or afghanistan as your main way of addressing the the war on terror there's got to be easier less costly ways of doing it mm -hmm. and uh and uh that those usually involve uh, you know lots of intelligence cooperation and uh particularly limited military engagements when you have them. So it's not so much about the number of military engagements, it's about their duration, because that's when you really uh, spend the most money when you're starting to have uh, 
long-term presence of large number of troops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says Sun Tzu said, avoid long wars. <laughs> you know, and that's definitely uh, something that's quite relevant. Um, Nick, do you have any last closing statements on this? Yes, I do. And it's from a very old general that I took quite a liking to for a while. And his name is Douglas MacArthur. So if you guys have the... Uh, time to read about him do so i mean he's a bit of a pain but also very smart in terms of strategy and what he said rings very much true in foreign policy or when especially when it comes to warfare and counterterrorism. there is no substitute for victory i will repeat that again no substitute for victory all right. Well, with that, it looks like we're out of time. So that concludes this episode of the Wisdom Factory podcast. I hope you found this enlightening and that you developed a greater understanding of the issue of counterterrorism and state sponsors of terrorism. And together we can build a better world and make the United States safer from any threats that it may encounter. And uh, with that, goodbye, everyone. God bless America. And we will see you in the next episode right, of this podcast. Bye. Bye.